Welcome back to the Prescribed Burn Workshop. In this video, we are going to be covering summer burns and the unique dangers they present. The encouragement to conduct summer burns has come and gone in the past but really seems to be taking hold lately. There are numerous management reasons why you might want to burn in the summer versus in the spring or the fall or the winter. But in this video, we're going to be looking at summer burns from the eyes of a burn boss and the burn crew because summer burns really do have unique and dangerous lookout situations that you don't find in other burns. From the burn boss's perspective, the summer really does add more burn days to your total burn year. Those of you who have tried to get in spring burns know that a wet spring, rainy spring, can really hamper your efforts and prevent you from getting all the burns in that you want. And so it is true that the summer generally has less rain, particularly here in the prairie states, and that means you have more possible burn days. But what I want you to look at when we get into this are the parameters we use to actually decide when it is safe to burn. That is, what's our prescription? Prairie states, the parameters for conducting a fire generally follow the rule of thumb of 20-20-80. Never burn below 20% humidity. And I really honestly think that once you start getting down below 30% humidity, the fire becomes very dangerous and very hard to control. The other 20 is never burn above 20 mile an hour winds. And again, once you get above 15, you're starting to fight a pretty good fire. By the time you get to 20, you're going to be um, really struggling with that fire. And the last rule of thumb, the 80, stands for never burning above 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And the idea behind, at least the idea that I've been told, is that fire behavior steps up again as you get above 80. As it starts getting warmer, fire becomes harder and harder to control. My experience has been that temperature doesn't have any major influence on the fire, at least from 80 to 100. What really is changing is the humidity. And the other aspect of that that's really changing, the reason I think 80 is a good rule, 85, somewhere in there, is the, the effect temperature has on your crew. As you start getting above 80 degrees Fahrenheit, your crew no longer has the ability to step away from the fire and cool off. Once you're up into the hundreds, stepping away from the fire, you're still overheating. It's still very, very hot. And so crew safety becomes the, the big important factor and not necessarily uh, fire behavior. So let's take a look at a data set for the last four years and actually take a look at the number of available burn days found during the summer. This data set was collected from the Weather Underground, from their history page. It is from Manhattan, Kansas. That seemed like a, a fairly central location. I collected it from 2008 to 2011. And the dates used were from June 1st to sep uh, June 15th to September 15th of every year. So June, July, and August, the summer months. Maximum temperature was used. The humidity, I chose average humidity instead of the lowest humidity. Uh, you would think that the lower the humidity, the, the more likely the burn would get away, and that's true. Um, but low humidities in the summer really don't occur until late in the, e late in the afternoon. And I've, I really felt like if you've conducted summer burns before, we tend to get them done fairly early in the day. So I went, went with average. If you go with low humidity, you'll actually end up with fewer burn days. And you'll see here in a minute why that probably doesn't really matter. For wind speed, I went with maximum wind gust. Um, if maximum wind gust wasn't listed, I went with uh, just maximum wind, wind speed for the day. The heat index, there's a lot of different formulas for calculating the heat index. This is the formula I used. It seemed to be the best fit for the temperature and humidity range we were in. Um, you can play around with that number and you might find that it bumps your maximum heat index or heat index up or down maybe five or six degrees. I also collected rain uh, as a yes or no, so either it did rain or it didn't rain. I wasn't real concerned with when it rained. So if it started raining at 11.50 p.m., that was still listed as a rain day. So if you sit down and move, manipulate this data, you could probably add a few more burn days by spending time with days that did rain and didn't rain. So let's take a look at the results. As it turns out, we had 372 days that we could have burned from over the four year period. Of those, only 157 days had wind speeds at 20 miles an hour or less. And that gave us about 39 days per year to burn um, using summer burns. So those of you who have tried to get in burns in the spring know how hard and infuriating it can be. And so this is some welcome information. If you look at humidity, we need humidity above 20%. And again, as it turns out, for these four years, 
none of the days that were good for wind speed um, were kicked out due to low humidities. That is, we always had humidity. I think the lowest humidity recorded was 32 degrees for these uh, 157 days. But keep in mind, that's only a portion of our prescription. The prescription 202080 also includes temperature under 80 degrees. And if you look at that, then that cuts it down to 24 days total out of the four years, or about six days a year. If you look at the heat index, and this is what I really think is important, this is the effect the heat, the temperature, and humidity is having on your crew. So once you get above, I think 80 is probably too low, and, and here with 80, that, gave, that cuts it down to 19 possible burn days. I really think you could probably push this up to 85, 90. Once you get into the low 90s, there's really no cooling off for the crew. Once the crew steps away from that fire to cool off a little bit, they're still heating up. They're just not heating up as fast. And you get in the upper 90s into the hundreds, they're still heating up really fast, and you're running the risk of, of heat stroke and heat exhaustion for your crew. I actually went back and then looked at the number of days that fall under what I would consider summer, which is July and August. And it turns out for July and August, over that four-year period, there were only six possible burn days. And that's about one and a half days per year. So the proponents of burning in the summer are correct. It does add burn days. But if you keep it in prescription, at best, it only adds six probably more like five and if you're really considering a summer burn during the summer it's really only adding one and a half burn days. So, so I wanted to show you a series of clips of the crew taking a knee, taking their hat off, putting their hose down, walking away from the heat, whatever, uh, but decided that I didn't really want to single them out. So what you'll see here are some clips of me doing this uh, exact same behavior due to the heat and I compared it to random clips from other uh, burn days in the spring and it turns out I found zero times when I took my helmet off uh, due to exhaustion, stepped away from the fire due to exhaustion or put my hose down due to exhaustion. The clips you're going to see occur 15 minutes after this particular video is being shot. That is right after the fire has, has begun and I think I stopped maybe eight times somewhere in there. So here we are 15 minutes into the burn. I'm putting the hose down and stepping across the fire line to get some air and relax. Uh, the strippers requested some Gatorade, so I'm running some Gatorade out to them. That doesn't really count as me taking a break, but it was nice to get away from the heat. Um, even with this little tiny fire line, that's a lot of heat you're standing in. Here I am taking a helmet off, stepping away from the fire. Another shot of me hanging the hose up, taking a break. This is all, all these clips occur within 15 minutes of the fire starting and this entire series is only 15 minutes. Again, <laughs> dropping the hose, crew boss taking a break, stepping across a fire line to cool off. Another clip, taking the helmet off. And then, you know, I went through other videos and I, I'm just not doing this behavior. Um, again, racking the hose for a second taking a break, heading back across the fire line. So this really takes a toll. I've only been at this point, it's been 30 minutes. That's not very much time to be on a, on a burn and take that many breaks. Be prepared, have plenty of water available, watch out for your crew, make sure people are taking breaks. It's a really, really good idea to have vehicles running that have air conditioning. So if a crew member does become overheated, you can rotate them in and uh, let them cool off. So let's take a look at the second danger of growing season burns or summer burns. And that is the green grass. The green grass will tend to put out a lot more smoke. It'll be a lot more accurate. It'll burn your lungs and it'll hurt. And the smoke, while not particularly black, is generally thick. And so looking back there in the smoke, there's a crew standing there. That's our backup engine, um, full crew, and they're all standing in the smoke. If they don't have any form of a respirator, bandana will not work, the little hot shot masks, those things aren't going to work. You're going to need um, a filter on that and goggles or the crew simply can't function. And right now if you look at where the burn boss is, that's him up at the front, without good communication we have no idea if a fire's jumped. In fact, that crew has no idea if a fire's jumped because they can't see forward or backwards where they are. So one of the dangers you're going to have is just the smoke and dealing with that smoke. If you have a wildfire and that wildfire jumps and starts burning across that fire guard to the back, you're going to be fighting that in, a, in the smoke. I mean, it's a, a, a really, really dangerous uh, situation. In this clip, I've stepped across a fire line and I'm looking back at our backup unit. And that's the third stripper in the distance. 
and you can see the backup unit sitting dead smack in the heavy smoke and if they had stayed back maybe twice the distance from they are they are from the front unit they'd actually be out of the smoke and be able to see and operate so one of the things to keep in mind is is where your backup unit really is and your backup crew are the if they're standing right there in that heavy smoke they aren't doing anybody any good now you can still have a fire jump across there and no one's going to see it but they aren't going to see it standing in the smoke either they may as well be back and out of that smoke out of the heat and uh, in a safer place here we are setting the head fire take a look at how small that fire is and how much smoke it's putting out right there at the beginning of the clip you can see all the way across the valley here in a few seconds you aren't going to be able to see very far at all so when we consider smoke management just in general and putting on a, a fire and, and getting that smoke to go the directions we want it to go keep in mind something as thick as this is going to be a real problem for you in this next clip what I want you to pay attention to are these two black lines on the ground. This is put down by the stripper we're anchoring off to the gravel road there in the background. I'm going to come back through here in a second and I'll actually get disoriented from the smoke. I won't be able to see where I'm walking. I cut across those two black lines. And probably a good rule of thumb, if you can't see where you're going, the smoke is too thick. So here I am, here I am coming across into that smoke and I'm actually going the wrong angle. There's the two black lines and I'm cutting the wrong direction and I just turn around and come out. I, I can't see where I'm going. That fire in the background is actually the burn we did earlier in the day. So this is the second summer burn. Just a few seconds later, I'm coming back through to make sure this anchor is tied off and out. And what I want you to look at is look for my engine. I can't see my engine, I can't see my crew boss, I'm now fighting a fire by myself and I think a good rule of thumb should be never fight fire on your own. Now the only thing that's keeping me safe is communication and we all know the communication fails, radios fail, batteries fail. I'm not that far away from them but if there's a problem, if there's a jump, they can't even see me. This is one of the problems uh, really caused by the smoke. So as I turn around to follow up with my engine, I'm putting out a creep fire that's creeping back across the fire guard. I have 150 feet of hose unspooling off of that unit as it pulls away from me. This is really not a good situation to be in and it's caused by the thick smoke generated by growing season burns. So let's take a look at some of the protective equipment we use. This half mask here is a typical uh, particle filter mask. I think these are actually bought at Home Depot. Uh, they have a carbon filter on it and for dead season burns like the grass you see in the background they work great. In a green season burn or a growing season burn the, the acrid smoke that's coming off will still burn your lungs a little bit. You can feel it uh, but you can breathe very very nicely. In this next mask, if you take a look at the uh, crew member I'm working with, she has a full face mask as well as the respirator. And the nice thing about this, for those of you who wear glasses, this is very, very helpful. Um, working with goggles and the half mask is a bit of a pain. Um, this does a great job of, of cutting out the smoke and allowing you to stand in the smoke and see what you're doing. Bandanas are completely useless during a summer burn. They're really useless at any point. Um, it's probably more psychological than it is anything else. I've used the Hot Shots uh, face shields. I like those as a vapor or temperature barrier protection, but they really don't do much in the way of filtering. Uh, for summer burns, I use the, the half mask and the goggles. I like that combination. It allows me to cool off a little bit more than the full face mask. These are the goggles I use. Um, they're mounted uh, halfway on the helmet. I like that because it allows you to flip them around, keeps them in place. The foam around the outside of the, of the glass really allows it to vent. I've only fogged them up a few times. I really like that. But it doesn't do a really good job of keeping um, the smoke out of your eyes. The big par particles are filtered out by this, but your eyes will still start burning if you've been in the smoke for a while. So I'll probably switch to a different kind of a goggle at some point. Well, I hope you're finding these videos educational and I really hope they're stimulating discussion between you and the rest of your crew. There's a lot of Monday night quarterbacking going on. I think that is actually valuable. Send that information along. I th really honestly think it would be more valuable if you posted those questions online because a lot of them are valid questions and really good discussion points. If there's something that you and your crew do differently, by all means share it. This is an educational opportunity for all of us to discuss different practices. And again, if you regularly burn, make sure you keep your hours up. You need to treat this just like flight time. And if you're interested in getting into prescribed burning, the best way to do it is to start volunteering and working with an existing burn crew. 
these uh, online classes are only supplemental information. There's no way they're going to help you conduct a safe burn.